We can look at the events of our world through different eyes when we know that God is sovereign in the affairs of our world, even in places that we think are completely outside of the will and purposes of God. Something in your eyes I see Reminds me of what it used to be When I was still uncertain of the truth And sleepless nights that turn to day Alone inside an endless space Counting on someone to see me through and if there's one thing I know You were never left alone Cause you can always call on Jesus' name And if there's one thing I pray Jesus helps you find a way To make a change and listen God will take away your pain If you choose to let it go If there's one thing I know How can I convince your heart Is the light will find you in the dark And only he can make your blind eyes If we speak of the lost things found Or lives that have been turned around Tell me who knows better, child, than me And if there's one thing I know You were never left alone Cause you can always call on Jesus' name If there's one Jesus helps you find a way to make a change and listen to your heart. And God will take away your pain if you choose to let it go. If there's one thing I know, I would never stake my life on any lesser thing. Then the cross of Christ where he gave his life To ease my suffering If there's one thing I know You were never left alone You can always call on Jesus' name And if there's one thing I pray Jesus helps you find And listen to your heart Cause God will take away your pain If you choose to let it go If there's one thing I know If there's one Recorded on location in Keswick, England, Charles Price teaches from the book of Isaiah. Today's message is The Sufficiency and Sovereignty of God, Isaiah 44, 1-4 and 9-21, and chapter 45, 1-3. Isaiah speaks of replacing the present idols of life with future treasures God has in store for us. I'm glad you're here this morning, and we're going to look into Isaiah chapter 44 and 45. Before we do so, let me just briefly say a few words about the structure of Isaiah. It really is like a mini Bible. It's made up of 66 chapters, 
as the Bible has met over 66 books, and it divides into two distinct parts. The first part is 39 chapters long, and the second part is 27 chapters long. It just so happens the Old Testament has 39 books, and the New Testament has 27 books. And interestingly, the message of the first 39 chapters can be seen to summarize the message of the Old Testament. Whilst the last 27 chapters can be seen to summarize the message of the New Testament. First 39 chapters were written during Isaiah's own lifetime, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And basically the message there is that God has created us for fellowship with himself. But our fellowship has been broken, and people are left with the inability in themselves to get right with God and the inability to live as they were intended to live. And there is both the threat of judgment, but also the promise of redemption that runs through those chapters. The last 27 chapters are looking ahead to a new era beyond Isaiah's lifetime. We won't discuss this, but there's been a lot of debate about the authorship of Isaiah. And he speaks with such precision 200 years into the future that there's been a lot of doubt about whether he actually wrote it himself and whether there was not two, three, or up to actually somebody proposed 70 authors of the book of Isaiah. But uh, Isaiah is giving prophetic insight into that period when the Babylonians have come in and taken Judah off into exile. They themselves are then overrun by the Persians. That's today's Iran, as opposed to Babylon, today's Iraq. And this last section from chapter 40 on, these last 27 chapters, begin with a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Statement later used by John the Baptist at the beginning of the New Testament. It then introduces us to the servant of the Lord, who is anointed by the Holy Spirit to preach good news to the poor. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. And then he dies for the sins of his people in chapter 53 and is raised again from the dead. Three times he tells them, you are my witnesses. And he finishes in chapter 6 saying, I'll make all things new and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. So these last 27 chapters are, are, are very beautiful foreshadowing of the New Testament. If you were to be marooned on a desert island and allowed to take one book of the Bible with you, you would do well to take the book of Isaiah. It is a mini Bible in itself. Now, these last two mornings, we're going into this second part of Isaiah today in chapter 44 and 45, and tomorrow we'll look into chapter 53, which is that most amazing prophecy of Christ as substitute being wounded for our transgressions. And we'll look at that tomorrow. I want to build what I'm going to share with you this morning from chapter 44 and 45 around two promises, two very important promises. First in chapter 44, verse 3, it's a promise made to the people of God. For I will pour water on the thirsty ground and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. This is a promise about the sufficiency of God for his people. The deep thirsts of your heart, I'm going to pour out the water that will satisfy those thirsts. And then in chapter 45, verse 3, it's a promise made to Cyrus, king of Persia. And he says to him there, I'll give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. And this is a promise concerning the sovereignty of God over his people, that Cyrus, king of Persia, though you may appear to be the oppressor of my people, you are really my servant. He calls him my shepherd on one instance, and he says to Cyrus, I'm going to bring treasures out of darkness where you least expect them. So there are promises about the sufficiency of God for his people and the sovereignty of God in his world. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Let's look first then at 
chapter 44, and this beautiful promise, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. Judah has been taken into exile by the Babylonians. You probably know some of those circumstances. Babylon had breathed down the neck of Judah for a number of years and in three stages had invaded Judah and taken people away into exile until the last stage when they sieged the city of Jerusalem for 18 months and basically starved it into surrender over that period of time and utterly destroyed the city so much so when Nehemiah came back some years later, he could not take his mule through the city because everywhere was just uh, bricks and stones and uh, destroyed buildings that blocked everywhere that he could go. And they took the people off into a Babylonian exile into 70 dark years for the people of God. Less than 50 years after this, Babylon began to wane as the superpower of the Middle East and Persia began to rise and they became in due course the new masters of the Middle Eastern world. And Isaiah is looking ahead to this period now when the Persians are dominating the people of Israel in their exile. And he speaks words of hope. And if I can summarize, not just here, but some of the previous chapters too, he's saying that God chastises those that he loves, that this event was not a calamity, a tragedy, an out-of-control event. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, was my servant. God describes him as elsewhere in the Old Testament, who has come in for the purpose of disciplining and chastising, and the chastisement of God is always remedial. It's not an end in itself to humiliate. It's designed to correct. It's designed to restore. And when God does bring chastisement and discipline into our lives, it is always remedial in its objectives that it might make us better people, though if we do not respond to that chastisement, it will make us bitter people. Those are the options in our response to God's discipline. We become better or we become bitter. And he gives these promises of hope, and this one is that I'm going to satisfy the deep thirst of your souls. And the deep thirst of the people of Israel, I'll pour water on thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I'll pour out my spirit on your offspring, my blessing on your descendants. The fulfillment of this really was in Pentecost, of course, uh, like the prophecy of Joel that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost when the spirit was poured out. But what this verse indicates to us is that there is a thirst in the soul of men and women that only God can satisfy. Something you and I can believe about every person you meet is they have a thirst for something bigger than themselves and outside of themselves. And a big part of this chapter 44 is given over to describing the alternatives by which we seek to satisfy our thirst, the alternatives to God himself. And he talks about the futility of idol worship. And, and I want to look at what he says about idols first, from verse 9 to 20. I'm calling it the deadly properties of idolatry. And then we'll come back to the early part to see the life-giving properties of the Holy Spirit the deadly properties of idolatry. Because he says in verse 9, all who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Those who speak up for them are blind, they're ignorant to their own shame. Now just pause there a moment. Look, look at what he's saying and, and the, 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 the negative descriptions he gives of these people who, who, who turn to idols. The idols are nothing. Their treasure is worthless. Worthless. 
Those who speak for them are blind, they're ignorant to their shame, which begs the important question, why in the world do people worship idols when they're nothing, worthless, etc.? All over the world, people engage in idol worship. Some of it is very obvious to us. But it would be a mistake to think of idols simply as being made of wood or stone or metal or ivory or them being statues and carvings and sticks. Ezekiel 14, verse 3, says that God says about the leaders of Israel, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. That the idolatry to which most people fall are not the external idols of stone, but their internal idols of the heart. John Calvin wrote, the human mind is a perpetual factory for idols. It's forever producing idols. Tim Keller, whose name will be known to many of you, and I recommend to you his books, and there are many of them. I don't know how he gets the time to write them, but he keeps producing them. Tim Keller is the minister of the Church of the Redeemer in New York City. And he has given a lot of thought to the idols of our age. I recommend a book called Counterfeit Gods. And Tim Keller's work is mainly among upwardly mobile young people in Manhattan. And he's come to the conclusion that most people today in the 21st century are being driven by a culture of idolatry. He describes idols as spiritual addictions. He identifies some of them as money, materialism, sex, power, body image, work, ambition, reputation, food, that isn't new because Paul in Colossians 3 verse 5 said about sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, says Paul. These are not stone idols. They're the idols Ezekiel describes as being in our hearts. And Keller defines an idol in this book as something we can't live without. And he talks about how money, which begins as a servant, we want money because we want to use it, it becomes a powerful, life-altering, culture-shaping God that as it grows in power, makes us do what we would not normally do and eventually, he says, breaks the hearts of those who worship it. He talks about lust and sex as a driving power in a person's life. And he says, and if you feed lust enough, it'll become strong enough to break the rules you intend to live by and redefine what you see as right and wrong. It'll master you. And in our day where pornography has become so readily available and so culturally acceptable, it does and it will destroy. It is addictive. He talks about power. He talks about in marriage, sometimes husbands lord it over their wives. Wives sometimes manipulate and control their husbands. And this ability to control becomes an idol. Talks about parents who plot out their children's lives and then resent it and resist it when their children actually have their own ideas. He says this is all manifestations of idolatry. That our sense of significance, our sense of security, our sense of satisfaction is founded in exercising this kind of power. And Keller says, you know it is a God when you must have it and you're driven to break the rules you once honored to harm others and even ourselves in order to get it. Now, the message of Isaiah regarding idolatry here is that though it is empty in itself, it fills a need 
that was designed to be filled by God himself. And when we become disconnected from the true God, then we look for idols because we need idols. We cannot live in a vacuum where nothing is driving us and giving our lives meaning. Something has to step into that vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. It'll suck into it anything to fill it. And if we deny the true God, we have to create alternative God. And yet, if we are rational about those gods, they are utterly futile. There's some brilliant sarcasm here in uh, how he describes these gods. Let me just read you what he says about a blacksmith in verse 12. He says, the blacksmith takes a tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and he grows faint. In other words, this thing is, is wearing him out and it exhausts him. And what he's doing is building an idol. It doesn't energize him, it exhausts him. He talks about the carpenter in verse 13. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in the form of a man, a man in all his glory that it may dwell in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or perhaps took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest or planted a pine and the rain made it grow. It is man's fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles the fire and bakes bread, but he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire, over it he prepares his meal, he roasts his meat and eats his fill, and he warms himself and says, ah, I am warm, I see the fire, but the rest he makes a god, his idol, and he bows down to it and worships, and he prays to it and says, save me, you are my god. I mean, how ridiculous. I cooked my food with some of the wood, and I warmed myself with some of the wood, and I worshiped some of that same wood, and say, you are my God, save me. <laughs> Why does he do it? Why does he behave so bizarrely? Because he has to. As Augustine famously said, of God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. We need to believe that about every human being you meet. We were made to know God, and we fill him with substitutes. I saw Russell Brand being interviewed by Piers Morgan last week. He's currently doing his Messiah Complex World Tour. It's advertised as featuring Jesus Christ, Che Guevara, Gandhi, Malcolm X, and special guest Adolf Hitler. In this interview with Piers Morgan, when they got to some of the froth and bubble and, you know, what's all this about, Russell Brand, for once, looked serious, and he said, you know, we're all looking for God. And then he clumsily said, a man looking for a prostitute is looking for God. Actually, he was, he was semi-quoting G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton said, any man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. Why? Because his search for intimacy and his search for ecstasy deep in his soul was designed to be found in knowing and experiencing God. These men says God to Ezekiel, have set up idols in their hearts. Because you know that people are asking the right questions. But they have no idea that the answer is God himself. And so instead, the only alternative they have is idolatry. It's a common need. As Ecclesiastes 3.11 says in the NIV version, God has set eternity into the hearts of men. You know, you can go to any city in the world, probably any time in its history, whether it's primitive or whether it's sophisticated, is irrelevant. And you may not see great industry in every place. You may not see great places of learning in every place. You may not see the 
great accumulation of wealth in every place, but you will see evidence of worship. You will see the temple or the mosque or the shrine or the church or the idols. Because we need to know God. Chapter 44, verse 9. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. The whole thing is actually empty when it is anything other than God. The idolater clings to his straws. He lacks discernment to see their emptiness. Verse 19, here's the scary part, if you like. Verse 19 says, no one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I use for fuel. I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? Of course, it's a lie, but he does not have the knowledge or the discernment to recognize it because into that human heart, there is a God-shaped vacuum. I think it was Pascal who described it that way. In every human being, a God-shaped vacuum that sucks into it all kinds of idols, whether they're physical or internally emotional to meet that deep need. By the way, let me just say this. I, I think we as Christian believers ought not to be too intimidated by the corruption of the world around us that we see is so far from God. If we were to see it as an appetite for God, misguided, deluded, but a search for what we were created to enjoy, which is fellowship and union with God and the spirit of Jesus Christ meeting the deep need of our hearts. If we see it that way, we'll be less inclined to be judgmental and more inclined to be compassionate. But what is the remedy? Well, if those are the deadly properties of idolatry, in verse 9 to 20, We'll backtrack to the first few verses, the life-giving properties of the Holy Spirit. I read the verse again. I'll pour water, verse 3, on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. The indication there is that the land, being a picture of the people, is thirsty. I think it's a wonderful study to see how Jesus handled people. When he met the woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4, you remember he offered her living water, the same image used here. And as he engaged her in conversation, he slowly unraveled her story. Remember that? She'd been married five times. He asked a very embarrassing question, go and call your husband and come here. Well, that brought it out. She said, I don't have a husband. No, but you have had five. Or well, you're now living with a man to whom you're not married. She was obviously ostracized by the local people because that is why she came alone in the heat of the day to the well. Normally you go in the cool of the day. And as in many cultures, and I've seen them, in areas of the world where people still go to gather water from a well or from a river, they will go together. The women of the village will go together. But she went alone. She was ostracized. Well, why wouldn't she be? She's been married five times. She's now living with another man. I mean, who's the next husband she's going to steal? That's not having anything to do with her. And you know, Jesus didn't criticize her for her failed marriages. He didn't criticize her sex life. He recognized that all of this was a symptom of a thirst. And he said, everyone who drinks this water, referring to physical water, but he's talking about something much bigger as well. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. This man you're now living with, he won't satisfy you. He can't satisfy you. 
because he cannot touch the deepest area of your heart and your need. But he said to her, whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Madam, if you'll drink what I'm offering you, not only will this water satisfy your thirst, it'll be in you like a well, and a well is always deep, and it'll be in you like a spring, and a spring is always fresh. It'll be a well of water springing up deep within you, producing every day something fresh. And I ask you here this morning, what are you drinking to meet the deep needs of your soul? Well, we might say, well, we're here at Keswick, of course, and therefore we might assume that we're drinking deeply from the Lord Jesus. And that is a wonderful thing. But I wonder if there are not people here this morning or listening to my voice, and you have secret areas in your life. You know, I've learned to talk to people who are troubled and they're struggling. I've learned to ask them a question. Tell me your secrets. Sometimes they're very embarrassed. No, between you and me, totally confidential. Tell me your secrets. Because in the area of your secret, you often have built an idol. locked away in deep inside your heart. And that idol will increasingly push, though you may be a Christian, the Lord Jesus out of your life. You know, in Japan, a lot of homes have a God shelf. Sometimes a problem with evangelism in Japan is somebody says, yeah, I'd like to become a Christian. So what they do is get some symbol of Christianity, like a cross, and they go home and they just move the gods along the god shelf to make room to stick a cross there as well. And of course, that god shelf has to go if Christ is going to come. But you know, we build god shelves in our hearts. And those things tend to drive us. And they tend to grow in power. And though they are lifeless idols, they become controlling principles in our lives. If you go back through the history of Israel, you realize that this whole exile was a chastisement because of their idolatry. And one of the things that the exile did was remove the idolatry from Israel. You never again see or hear or read of Baals or Ashtoreth poles. The exile cured them of idolatry because sometimes God has to bring us to that point where we realize the utter bankruptcy of those idols and the bankruptcy of our own lives as we seek to honor these things and we want them and we allow them to become increasingly controlling in our lives. But as he chastises them, Let me read you verse 21. Now, this is after he's talked about the idols. Verse 21 and 22. He says, remember these things, O Jacob. What he's doing is reminding them here about their idolatrous past. Isaiah's looking ahead to this period of captivity, and he's looking back with them to their idolatrous past. He says, remember those things, O Jacob, for you are my servant, O Israel. I have made you, you are my servant, O Israel, I will not forget you. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. You see the passion of God here. He speaks of, O Jacob, O Israel, twice, O Israel. There's a, there's a pleading, a passionate pleading there. O Israel, you have brought yourself into this place of bowing down to idols, but I have swept them away. And that sweeping them away must be along with our pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. You know, getting rid of the idols isn't in itself the solution. It is replacing them with Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God.
That's why Jesus said, if you cast a demon out of a man and don't replace it, he'll come back seven times worse. That's why our ministry is always be positive, not just getting rid of, getting rid of, getting rid of, but coming to, coming to, coming to Jesus and finding in him that deep need of the heart being met and satisfied. And you may have been a Christian for many years, as many of you have, but every day we need that fresh water in our own thirsty soul, that fresh receiving from Jesus, his presence, his life, his sufficiency for that deep need. That's why after the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah walks through the rubble and writes the book of Lamentations, five chapters, it's called weeping. The lamentation means crying, it's just a book of tears. But in the midst of his tears, he looks up and he says, but this I call to mind, therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. It's every morning. It's not living today on yesterday's supply or living tomorrow on today's supply. You can't stockpile spiritual blessing at a week of Keswick to last you for the next six months or next 11 months and three weeks. You'll need a fresh supply next Saturday morning and a fresh supply next Sunday morning as we come to the Lord Jesus and say, Meet that deep need in my heart. That's the message of chapter 44. Your longing for God becomes expressed in a building of foolish idols. It's about the sufficiency of God for his people. And just very quickly in the next few minutes, in chapter 45, he turns his attention now to Cyrus, who is the king of Persia who has overrun the Babylonians, and now has the fate of Israel in his hands, and uh, is the most powerful man in the world. And he says to him in verse three, I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, that you may know I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. Cyrus is an outsider, but I want you to know that I, the God of Israel, am really God, and I want you to know this, by out of things that people think are dark, I'm gonna bring treasures. Out of secret places, I'm gonna bring riches. It's interesting to to see what the Bible says about Cyrus, and we, we haven't time to look beyond this passage, but back in Isaiah 44, verse 28, he says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and will accomplish all I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt in the temple, let its foundation be laid. And and Cyrus, certainly, the Persian people were very kind to their occupied territories and peoples. And uh, it was Cyrus who sent Ezra back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. You read that in the book of Ezra. It was Artaxerxes who replaced Cyrus, who sent Nehemiah back or permitted Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem. What an amazing thing that God says of this pagan king, he is my shepherd. And in Isaiah 45, verse 1, this is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of. You know, this is my anointed. And like a little boy, I take him by the hand, (laughs) even though he's the pagan king. And in chapter 45, verse 13, I'll raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I'll make all his ways straight. And what I want us to see from this is not only the sufficiency of God for his people, in chapter 44, but the sovereignty of God over his people, in chapter 45, that God, in the circumstances we often think are oppressive to us, is actually working to bring about his purpose, and he is bringing treasures out of darkness into our lives. Persia is today's Iran. Do you know, in the country of Iran, those who know it well tell us there have been more converts to Christianity in the last 20 years than in the previous 2,000 years. In the Iranian diaspora, which is significant in many parts of the world, Iranians are coming to Christ. And do you know what triggered it? It was the 1979 
revolution and the Ayatollah Khomeini. And as a result, the Iranian nation has become so disillusioned that many are turning to Christ. And some of you may be familiar with that. I was talking to somebody yesterday who told me that in the church they attend in Yorkshire, they have a lot of Iranian Christians there. You see, when we in the West saw the news of the 1979, if you were around in those days, as most of you were, 1979 revolution, Remember the Shah on the run around the world trying to find a refuge? Unfortunately, he got sick and died, fortunately, politically, because that meant the end of the problem of trying to find somewhere for him to go. Huh. But what a tragedy. No. What God has said to the predecessor of the king of Persia, of Iran, I'm going to bring treasures out of darkness. We can look at the events of our world through different eyes when we know that God is sovereign in the affairs of our world in the wonderful things that he is doing, even in places that we think are completely outside of the will and purposes of God. Egypt has been in the news a lot for the last two years, of course, since the 2011 revolution and then earlier this year, uh, the new revolution, whether it's a coup or not, technically speaking. But you know, God is doing amazing things in Egypt. I was in Cairo two months ago, and I was at a church called Casa El Debara, which is the largest evangelical church in the Middle East. There have about 7,000 people there over the weekend, and they have a huge missionary outreach across North Africa, and into Iraq, Jordan, Syria, that whole part of the Middle East. Until two years ago, they were having three, sometimes four, baptismal services a year to baptize converts. That's a big event in a Muslim country when you're baptized. Sammy Morris, who is the pastor there, the minister there, he was a cardiologist until he became the minister just about five years ago. And he came, we invited him to Toronto, and he came to our church during our missions conference last year. And he said, you know, we used to have this baptism three or four times a year. He said, but then people started coming to Christ during and after the revolution. So we began to have a baptism service every month. He said, now we have a baptism service every week. We have a weekly baptism service. And when I was there two months ago, I said, how's the baptisms going? He said, we could have one every day now. They don't, but they could. <laughs> These are all treasures of darkness that God, in a world that looks to be opposed to him, are actually places where in the darkness he's producing treasure as he promised Cyrus. In Argentina, there's been a great revival. And do you know when it began? It began after the Falklands War. I was with Luis Palau recently, who some of you know, and who has been here to speak at Keswick. And Luis Palau said, you can date the Argentinian revival to the Falklands War, when the military junta, who people were trusting, failed. And Britain rose up and humiliated them. And people became, again, disillusioned. They lost their idol. And they began to turn to God. I was in Chile not long ago. Do you know in Chile they have a national day of evangelicals, 31st of October. It's, it commemorates the date that Martin Luther nailed his 39th thesis to the church in Wittenberg. And that is now a national holiday. It was, it was first a national evangelicals day. It wasn't a holiday, but now it's an actual holiday. And everybody knows it's evangelicals day. And on 31st of October, every church in Chile preaches the gospel. Did you know there were so many Christians in Chile? <laughs> Guatemala, 40% of the population would be evangelical. I was there for pastor's day. 5,200 pastors came together from all over Guatemala, and they all have exciting stories of people coming to Christ and the church growing. 
Many of you know about China, but we don't know the facts about China. It's hard to put all the little incidental stories we'll hear together into one big picture. But in 1949, the time of the revolution, there were about a million Christians estimated in China. By 1952, I think it was, or 53, every missionary, every Westerner was driven out of China. And if I may say this, we in our arrogance in the West said, what is going to happen to the church in China now that missionaries have left? And the church went underground. Nobody knew anything till the mid-70s when Richard Nixon sent a table to his team to place some Chinese, and then he went and visited Mao Zedong, and the big church, the, the nation began to open. Little by little, people began to find out what's going on there. And nobody has exact figures, but people are saying there's probably 100 million Christians in China today. It may be 80 million, it may be 120 million, it may be 70 million. Nobody knows for sure. But where in the world has the church grown 70 times in 60 years. But a place where the church was oppressed and many people were put to death. Watchman Nee, you know, spoke from this platform in 1936. Had a huge impact at the Keswick Convention that year. He wasn't the main speaker, he was a guest. Nobody knew him. He was invited to pray. And he spoke about what was happening in the Japanese-Chinese war at the time. And if you read the yearbook for that year, which you probably won't because they're rare now, but I've got one. <laughs> it talks about the impact of this man, Watchman Nee. That's before he was well known. Watchman Nee had his tongue cut out. They're various stories. It's hard to know exactly what may be true, but he certainly died as a martyr. But you know, th these kind of men, they were sowing the seeds. I I'm just sharing with you the principle as it applies to the world we live in, that God said to Cyrus in his world, that Cyrus, you're not part of the covenant people of God, but you're my shepherd. I take you by the right hand and I lead you and I'm gonna give treasures in the darkness of what is going on. I'm going to give riches that are stored in secret places. And if that is true of Cyrus's day, and if it's true globally of our day, I know in our Western countries, we are not seeing that growth. We're seeing only a marginalizing of the Christian faith we are seeing reduction in numbers by and large. It's not panic. Maybe God is pushing us into that period where oppressed perhaps, we may not be as free as we have been, certainly not to say the things that we've been free to say from the word of God. We may lose charitable status and all those kind of things. We may be marginalized. But you know, it's in the darkness where God produces treasure. Let's trust him for that. And in your own life, in our own lives, in the things that have gone so wrong, in the things that have hurt us so much, in the pain that we never anticipated, we gave our lives to God and then we ran into tragedy or somebody died who should never have died that was totally, why in the world did God allow this to happen? Why did I get sick? Why did this happen? Why did I lose my job? Here's the principle. The principle is, I'll give you treasures in darkness. I'll give you riches that are stored in secret places. Why? That you may know that I am the Lord. That you may say, this is not to do with anything I have done. This is not to do with my own manipulation or my own scheming. This has to do with God in his wonderful grace and love and sovereignty bringing about his purpose. And that verse in Romans 8, 28, the, the, the authorized version is a bad translation. All things work together for good to those who love God. Things are passive. Things don't work. Things are not active. The better translations, like the NIV, in all things, God works for good. For those who love him in accord according to his purpose. So there are things that may be wrong. The devil is the prince of this world. There are things that are satanic going on all around us, but... Let's rest in the fact, in all things, whether good, bad, or indifferent, God works for good. 
And if we know in our own hearts, chapter 44, the sufficiency of God to meet that deepest need that otherwise will express itself in idolatry, in chapter 45, it's the sovereignty of God in the circumstances of our lives that we can trust and believe and know that one day, out of the darkness, will come treasure. Will you believe that? Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful this morning that your word is not simply a history book, but in space and time history, we see the wonderful workings of God in ways that in retrospect we can make a lot more sense of than we can in the present or looking to the future. But we thank you, this God is our God. We pray, Lord Jesus, we'll be men and women who drink deeply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. We take him into that deepest area of our hearts and souls that our greatest needs our need to be known, our need to be loved, our need to know and to love, that they may be met supremely in our union with yourself and our knowledge of God. But help us too, we pray, to keep our eyes on the circumstances that otherwise might intimidate us and know you bring treasure out of darkness, riches stored in secret places that we may know that you are God. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. What it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Mm, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I can do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Only imagine. Yeah.
still will I stand in your presence to my knees will I fall will I sing hallelujah will I be able to speak it all I can only imagine I can only imagine and I can only imagine